The speaker of the day is Derek Houghton. Derek will tell you uh, about his time in the Royal Air Force. He started life as a navigator uh, in electronics first and then into navigation. And he saw navigation go from uh, sun obs, uh, dead reckoning navigation, uh, up to inertial, and currently he's using uh, GPS. Uh, so he knows the navigation side of the back to front. But he got shanghaied into a very interesting job, a v VIP <laughs> flight coordinator, coordinator, and he's about to tell you all about it. Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I must say it's a privilege to be asked to talk to you, such an elite group. Uh, I'm also a bit overawed at them, because I normally talk to about 25 people downstairs, but there we go. Uh, this must be four times that, at least. My job is the chief ground instructor downstairs at the college, and as Brian said, uh, I, I've been here for a while. I've been here for about three years now, and before that, I was an RAF navigator, um, started as a radar fitter. During my time as... Uh, <coughs> VIP coordinator. I had the privilege of flying with a lot of important VIPs. Um, the reason I chose this subject was not to name drop, but I know that you talk a lot about wartime events, etc., understandably, but I thought this would be a little bit different. Um, one of the more interesting aspects, maybe, is the latter end of the talk, where I talk about various incidents that took place. Uh, you'll understand the sort of things I got involved in. Okay, so if I take it from there, um, hopefully you'll find it enjoyable. Let's start with my background then, just briefly, very briefly. The first aircraft I flew was that aircraft there. If you don't know what it is, it's a Hawker Siddeley 748. Okay, the C Mark 1 version, it's a tactical uh, air transport aircraft. It carries about 44 troops or Land Rovers or one-ton containers, which you can hurl out the back of the aircraft on the end of a parachute. It's a stall aircraft, short takeoff and landing capability, got some magnificent performance in the stall, stall roll, um, <coughs> and it has a kneeling undercarriage, so the aircraft can sit on its tail to load Land Rovers and take Land Rovers off. So that was where I started, I did two tours on that, one in the Middle East, one in the UK, and then I went on to, to this aircraft, which is the Andover C Mark II, or the August 748 CC Mark II. This is a VIP aeroplane. I actually flew this at Changi, the particular one. And this was used purely in the VIP role. And it actually carried three heads of services around the whole of the Far East. I spent 10 days going around Vietnam in the Vietnamese War, which was uh, quite interesting. Uh, came to Darwin, in fact, just before the, uh, the cyclone took it out. Um, so that was my VIP work. I was one of the youngest people ever to go on VIP work that aeroplane. After that, another rare aeroplane, I flew the Comet, the last flying Comet in the Air Force. Uh, that one was used for flight trials work, it was specifically built for the British Air Force. It's a Comet Mark IV-C, and if you look behind the nose wheel, you can see underneath a 12 foot long aerial boat, where we actually attached aerials because this aircraft was used for flight trials work. I did a lot of testing of avionic equipment, new avionic equipment for the Air Force. This aeroplane, beautiful aeroplane, my favorite aeroplane. Okay, so I finished up doing three and a half years on that aeroplane, and then I went on to this particular aircraft, which is the one I'm gonna talk about, which is the Vickers VC-10. Again, another lovely aeroplane, way ahead of its time, really. <coughs> it had four Conway engines, long-range transport aeroplane, you load it with people or freight. It had roller conveyors inside it. On the other side, you can't see it in the slide, but on the other side was a 12 foot square door, hydraulically operated door, where you can wheel one ton containers, Land Rovers, whatever inside, and roll them down the aeroplane. About 4,000 mile range, beautiful aeroplane. Uh, we also used to use it for carrying cluster bombs when we went to uh, Argentina, when we did, oh, the Falklands Islands, I should say when we went to the war down there. This was the aircraft that delivered all the cluster, cluster bombs to Ascension Island. Over that period, just out of interest, we flew uh, every six hours. There was a departure from the UK. There's only 13 aeroplanes, but every six hours we had a departure and we kept that up for three months without a single loss of flight. 
So it was quite a tremendous <coughs> achievement to get that many cluster bombs out to Ascension. On the way back, of course, we bought Bagley, the wounded and whatever. So that's the VC-10. Lovely aeroplane. I say a very stable aeroplane. A very fast aeroplane. The aeroplane flies at 0.84 Mach, or 0.86, or 0.88. I have, in fact, flown it at 0.9. If you remember, it was part of the London to New York air race. Okay. So that's the aeroplane I did five years on. I was a uh, flight commander on this particular squadron, looking after 200 aircrew. And after that, I went on to the, to the job I'm about to talk about. That's a picture of the cockpit of the VC-10. The, it's a four-man flight deck, very nice flight deck, very roomy flight deck. On the right-hand side here, this corner, you can see the engineer's station, and if you look to the left of his table, there are four throttles on the engineer's station. They're all, they are ganged or uh, connected to the throttles between the pilots, but on this aeroplane, the engineer applies the power. It's safer that way, we don't let the pilots touch the throttles. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the pilots call for power settings, and the engineer sets the power settings. The navigator was in the left-hand seat there, facing rearward behind the captain. So that's the aeroplane, or the flight deck, I should say. Another picture there, that's a, a black and white one, obviously. The reason I show that is you can see hanging down from the roof there is a peri periscopic sextant. That actually was the main nav, one of the main nav aids when I, was, uh, when I first started on this aeroplane. We used to go totally around the world just using Astra. Even towards the end of my time there, we were given special dispensation to cross the Atlantic with all the big jets, with their inertial systems and flight management computers. All we had was a navigator, a Doppler, if you know what a Doppler equipment is, and a sextant. But we achieved the same tracking accuracy, even with a sextant. So that's our particular... Uh, uh, that's where I started, basically. We did finish up with one inertial system, but that was it. All right, now I could have talked to you about that, but I think it'd be very boring, so I'll move on. So that's, that's the airplane, that's, that's uh, the VC-10. This picture, it comes up here. Yeah. That's actually me leaving Perth on the 2nd of August, 1988, with the Prime Minister on board. If you look just over the cockpit, you can see there are two flags flying. They actually go up the sextant hole, or when you push the sextant out. And when they go up that hole, they, they're spring-loaded, so they spring apart. One of them has the Royal uh, RAF ensign on it, and the other one has the flag of the country you're visiting. And part of my job was to sort out which flag went on where, which is quite a difficult job. <laughs> right at the back, just below the engines, if you have a look at it, there are two little mini pods. They will have some significance when I talk a bit later. Those are actually inf infrared generating uh, machines that send out pulses of infrared to decoy any missiles that are fired at the airplane. The aircraft, uh, the missile tends to follow the, the infrared pulse rather than go for the engines. So that was just a special fit for the VIP work. But that was actually the same me on the 2nd of August, 88. Who did I carry? Well, a uh, fairly limited number of people in reality. You can't get much higher than that really. That was the Queen, obviously, <laughs> and the Duke of Edinburgh. I took them to Lexington to look at racehorses and such like. My uh, more uh, frequent passenger, if I call it that, <laughs> was that lady, I'm sure you recognize. Um, she was my main passenger. But I also took the three senior cabinet ministers, the Foreign Secretary, Defence Secretary, and the Home Secretary. But uh, Mrs. Thatcher was the big one. So that, that, that's the aircraft. This is the lady we took. If I talk for a few minutes just about what my job entailed, not trying to bore you, but there's some interesting aspects come out of that, and then I'll move on to a couple of the incidents that happened, which is probably even more interesting. Okay, well, initially, what the Foreign Office or the VIP's office would do 
contact the Ministry of Defence to see if they could use an aeroplane. Once the Ministry of Defence decided that they could use an aeroplane, then the whole thing was transferred to me, my, my sole responsibility in the Air Force. And I talked or liaised with the Foreign Commonwealth Office about what the requirements were. So I was one man band doing everything for this, these particular trips. What they would do initially is they'd say, the Prime Minister wants to go to Gallipoli in March or something. Now, uh, I know you know where Gallipoli is, but I didn't at the time. Mm -hmm. I had to find, get out a map and find out where Gallipoli was. Uh, and then you've got to find the nearest suitable airfield. That was a big aeroplane, 325,000 pounds, very heavy aeroplane. So I had to find the right airfield with the right pavement strength, didn't want to go through the concrete obviously, the right crash category, okay, and the right refueling facilities. So I would actually find the nearest aircraft airfield, I'd say you can't go to that one, you've got to go to this one, or alternatively I'd find a suitable airfield, or, oh, sorry, if I couldn't find a suitable airfield, I'd ask for dispensation to do a one-off landing at a lower crash category or at a heavy weight than would normally be allowed. I would do that through the, the uh, embassy or the high commission, and usually you got permission, uh, providing it wasn't way over the weight limit. So that was the first step. Find out which airfields you could go to. As time progressed, they would probably add a few more places to visit. If you go to Singapore, they'd stop in Bahrain, Abu Dhabi, and so on on the way. So you'd have to look at those. Once they sort of thought up where they wanted to go, they would give you a vague route. And what I would do is actually um, put together <coughs> a basic timing schedule. What I'd do is work out what the flight plan times were between A and B, and then B and C, and so on. And that sounds easy. Bear in mind on a VIP flight, the aim of the exercise is to open the door at the far end with the VIP standing in the doorway on the precise second that you're supposed to arrive. That's the whole art. And so in flight, we're constantly adjusting the speed to try and make that door's time. So you've got to, you've got to have a fair guarantee that you're going to get there on time. So what I do is use the, the Met Office three monthly tables and used to use what is called the 70% wind component tables. What that means is on 70% of the occasions, the wind is for that route at that particular time of year is going to be more favorable than it says. That gives you a good batting average, if you like. So we used to use those to work out the flight time. And then the, the, the art, if you like, is trying to predict which runway you're going to land on. And then actually on the land, landing chart, the airfield chart, measuring off in thousands of feet how much taxiing time you want, converting it to minutes, and actually landing so that you can actually arrive at the right place at the right time. So all that had to be done as part of this exercise. Now you'd work that out for every sector, I'd give them those times, several days later they'd come back with an actual itinerary. The itinerary they gave you, or gave me, some of them worked because they didn't understand crew duty times, they don't understand airfield opening times and such like. So we had to mould it into something that was usable then, if that makes sense. Okay, so I put together an itinerary that I thought was usable. If necessary, if they wanted to keep the aircraft going all the way from Australia to UK in one go, I'd have to position slip crews at Hawaii or Washington or wherever. Fairly expensive exercise. Okay. I did have some say in the matter when we left here to go home having uh, in 88 I actually convinced them that it would be cheaper if they actually stayed for 16 hours on the ground at Hawaii and let the crew go to sleep and then wake up again they could sit on the beach and then we could continue on it saved positioning a crew out at Hawaii flying them all out civil and then flying them all the way back again the other one so it saved a lot of money so I had some say in it but Putting together that itinerary was a big thing. Okay. Having done that, okay, I <coughs> had to obviously um, obey the airfield opening hours. Having done that, though, I used to, once I finalised the itinerary, I used to have to talk to a number of people at Heathrow 
I had to talk to the London Heathrow Scheduling Committee, which is the organisation that gives you your slot time at Heathrow. There is no problem at getting a slot time if you have a VIP like this lady on board, but everybody else is shoved sideways so to make room for her. So the difficulty is reorganising everybody else around you. But I nevertheless had to go through them to organise that. If we wanted to take off during the jet man hours, Heathrow is banned jet takeoffs, or has a specific number of jet takeoffs is allowed during the night time, and I had to get dispensation to break those rules. Because the VC-10 is a very noisy aeroplane, got Conway engines, very, very noisy. So that was another, another set of uh, regulations, if you like, I had to get around. I had to talk to the British Airport Heathrow Schedule, uh, not the BAA um, com committee, airport committee, to actually book the VIP lounge. The VIP lounge is well away from the terminal at Heathrow, it's on the far side of the airfield, and that was booked in its entirety for this VIP party. So all those things had to be done. I then, having fixed the itinerary, got approval from all the people to do it, I actually wrote a thing called a transop. A transop is just a big email. And the email went to the squadron who were going to fly the aeroplane, it went to all the airfields you're going to, and it told them all sorts of things like what the itinerary was, what ground power was required, what the security arrangements were, because this aircraft had to be guarded all 24 hours a day, all the time it was away, from the time Miss Thatcher first got on it. Okay, it had to be guarded until she got off at the last stop. So security arrangements. I also had to list in there what height the steps had to be set at, because they don't waste time pumping steps up and down. They actually need to be driven in at the right height straight away. So again, all sorts of trivia that you don't normally get involved in had to arrange that. The biggest part of the job was after that, was putting together as a one man, putting together all the diplomatic clearance requests for every country you're going to fly through. Now if I had three VIP trips on the go at once, one of them uh, being a around the world trip, you can imagine how many emails you've got to send for every country one aircraft is going to fly around the world, it's quite a heavy task. But that had to be done, and they're all different. Some, some countries want to know what colour the aeroplane is, some want to know what the registration number is. So it's a, it's a real manual task, and I used to spend weeks, obviously, doing that. Okay, the diplomatic clearances went to the Air Attaché, usually, or British High Commission, and that's how I talked to the various countries. The aircraft, was taken, the two aircraft, we had a primary and secondary aircraft, they were taken off the flight line. The primary aircraft took two weeks to prep, everything was taken out of it, it was repainted inside, and the VIP was put in, the VIP fit was put in to the aircraft. There could be one or two VIP compartments, there could be a bedroom, there was a middle compartment where the bodyguards, the secretaries, usually about 10 secretaries, used to go, and then a rear compartment where the press used to go, used to be probably about 10 press on each trip, plus the RAF policemen who used to go and search the baggage. So separate compartments, the VIP compartment being at the front end of the airplane. I was positioned between the VIP compartment and the flight deck. It was my role to actually liaise between, or be the connection, if you like, between the crew and the VIP party to make things happen. Some additional items that people don't normally think about. Okay. One of the things was when you go to Africa, Africa's not well known for its uh, uh, quality of its blood. It's a lot of AIDS in Africa, as you're probably aware. We used to have to carry blood for the Prime Minister. Now that might sound easy. The blood has to be frozen. There's a special container which is frozen in, which means that if you sit for two, two three days in Nairobi, that blood has to be kept frozen. We have to have ground power on the unit for two or three days on, on the aeroplane running. So that, that's quite difficult to arrange sometimes. But blood was taken wherever it was needed. When we took the royal family, the royal family, if you're not aware, when, when you do a royal flight, in the United Kingdom you have 
and put a police space set up around the aeroplane temporary airway. My job was to make that happen. Two hours notice to get it in the right place at the right time. One of the other things that uh, people maybe aren't familiar with, when the royal family is going away to Canada, um, the North, North Atlantic is pretty cold. Uh, in case we had to ditch anywhere, then what we used to do is my job again, at short notice, because we didn't know the route until a couple of hours before, I had to arrange for a maritime patrol aircraft from Scotland to escort us underneath, flying underneath the VC-10, halfway across the Atlantic, and it turned around at 30 west and came back, and a Canadian maritime aircraft picked us up at 30 west and escorted us the other, the other side, just in case we came down in particular cold water. So search and rescue was another thing that I took care of. I also got involved in one particular occasion. Contingency planning was the other thing. If the Prime Minister wanted to go, she got a route laid out and she wanted to change her mind and go elsewhere, it was my job to make it happen. One particular incident that I remember, I was going to South Africa. She, I got a phone call the week before we left and if you, if you listen to the, to the words, it was quite difficult, this. A week before we left, the Foreign and Commonwealth took me as, office took me aside, and they said, it is quite likely that on the day before Namibia gets its independence, late in the evening, we will make the decision to go from the east coast to the west coast, and instead of going back to, to Namibia, that is, instead of going back up the east coast to the UK, we'll go back up the west coast. Now, that, that's not too difficult, but the thing is, they said in the second part of the conversation, you're not allowed to tell anybody. <laughs> uh, somehow, I got to get the crew to take all the maps, the charts, the approach plates for these airfields that they don't know they're going to. Okay, I had to get the rations, the ground power organized, and the diplomatic clearance. What I did was actually put all the diplomatic clearance signals in a big envelope, lock them away in my headquarters, and said to the duty operations officer, don't touch them unless I ring you. And uh, that's what precisely happened. Five o'clock, I think it was Nairobi, five o'clock they said tomorrow we're going to cross to Namibia. So I had to spend all night on the phone trying to make this thing happen. So again, something else that uh, can be a pain, let's say. Okay. <coughs> what else? On, on the day itself, departure procedure, we used to position at Heathrow the night before, we used to go to the VIP terminal, the VIP terminal at Heathrow, surrounded by metropolitan policemen with guns, rifles on the rooftops and Lord knows where, very difficult to enter, uh, unless you've got some form of ID. Um, we, RAF policemen used to search the, um, all the baggage, with the exception of the primary VIP par uh, person or party, if it was Mr. and Mrs. But all baggage was searched and nothing would go on the aircraft without being x-rayed. My role in flight was to make everything happen. I'll just leave it at that. I was the aircraft commander, or no, not the captain, but the aircraft commander, and I had to make her wishes come true, basically. Displaying the flags was part of the job. Okay, I had to contact the headquarters when we were away from base, tell them we'd arrived, were there any messages, fact that the VIP now wanted to go somewhere else, just keep everybody informed and I would authorise the trip for the following day if it had changed. So that was my total responsibility. Okay, a couple of last things. Those missile pods that you saw on the, uh, anti-missile pods I should say, on the aircraft, just to mention something about them, you need to actually, it's a rather peculiar system, typical Air Force system, to make it work effectively you need, really, to have a good idea what type of missile is coming at you. <laughs> Which is a bit tricky sometimes. <laughs> but basically, you have to select or make a selection in the cockpit between the pilots to activate a certain part of the circuit to suit that particular missile. It will work without, but it, it works most effectively if you get it tuned into the right missile, if you want to be so that's, that's something that I had to bear in mind. Did we have the right setting? The, the other thing... <coughs> is the Prime Minister, when she went, the, the, the Air Force had been antiquated, 
She had her own secure communications equipment if she wanted it. She could talk direct to Downing Street. Okay, two guys down the back with a special fit uh, talk uh, via coded messages to Downing Street, and that was what she used quite often to talk to, to her colleagues. And that, that, that's my role. That's very quick. It's a, it's a very brief overview. I'm sorry about that, but the more, the, the more interesting bit maybe is the next bit. I'll just talk about four incidents that took place while I was um, doing this particular job. And it gives you some feel for what I did get involved in, all the sorts of things. First incident happened on that particular trip, London, Toronto and back. That was a, it was Chogham. Chogham took place in Toronto that year, I was 87, 88, somewhere around there. And we spent about a week in Toronto. The night before we were due to leave, I was sitting in the hotel with the rest of the crew and the air attaché in Ottawa rang me up and he said we got this message from the Ministry of Defence. Cut a long story short, the message basically said, suspect IRA entered the country and also suspect carrying a missile which will be used to take or anticipate they're going to use it on takeoff from Toronto. Second part of the message said dispatching a fitter, a technician with a circuit board for the missile equipment to match it to the particular missile they thought the IRA would use against us. The, the fitter was going to arrive at early hours of the morning. We were departing fairly early in the morning. I couldn't do any more at that point. So in the morning, I went up to the aircraft with the crew, saw the fitter and said, is everything OK? You've arrived OK? Everything fitted? And she said, yes, all fitted. I said, OK, what setting do we have to set? She said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, and now in a dilemma, Mrs. Thatcher's on her way, we've got two hours to say, go off, don't know what setting we've got to sit. So I went down the back, it was one of these occasions where Mrs. Thatcher had her secure communications equipment on board. And I said, I'm sorry guys, I need to commandeer your equipment. <laughs> they said, well, what do you want to do? I said, well, I want to talk to my operating base, I want to know what we've got to set on this thing. And they said, they looked at me and they said, well, if you want a quick answer, <laughs> There's only one way you're going to get it, and that's to send a message using a, a, a priority, if I call it that, flash. Now, I don't know whether anybody's been involved in communications in the military before, but flash, the only time you ever use that is at the outbreak of war normally. It sets the world on fire. Uh, I didn't have any alternative, so I said send it. So <clears throat> this message went out, flash. It was obviously telephoned quickly across to the, to the MO Ministry of Defence office in Downing Street, virtually, and uh, I was anticipating an answer coming back. It landed on a group captain's desk who knew absolutely nothing about what the Air Force did, and he immediately picked up the phone to my headquarters back in the UK, and he said, wind up the secure communications equipment and tell this chap to set whatever it was the Air Force doesn't have any security communications equipment. So he made himself a bit of a fool. I think at that point he decided he was going to take it out on me sometime later. Anyway, back to Toronto, we didn't have the setting. We actually, Mrs. Thatcher arrived. You don't see notes of Mrs. Thatcher. So we started the engines, taxied out as slowly as we could, got to the end of the runway, received takeoff clearance, turned onto the runway, started to open the throttles, and at that point the tower said, Ascot 1, 2, 3, 4, select Alpha 3. And that, that was as late as it got, as we were starting to roll. So it was a pretty, pretty short time interval between that and taking off. You can guess what's going to happen as I go back to uh, RAF uh, Abhaven or High Wickham, I can't remember which it was at the time. Group captain phoned me up and said, You are not to commandeer Mr. Thatcher's secure communications equipment. And I said, Look, sir, I represent the Air Force. I represent this headquarters. I'm responsible for our safety. I'll do what's necessary.
to a chore and say, if you don't like it, take me off this job. Fortunately, he started to back down at that time and I kept my job, but uh, that was one particular incident. I hope that was of interest. <laughs> Another one here. Uh, this was London to Moscow. We went three times to Moscow when I was with Mrs. Thatcher. This was before, just before Glasnost, if you remember. She went to see Mr. Gorbachev, went to the Bolshoi. I went with her to the Bolshoi. Um, another incident of interest may be held here. If I just come away from that slide for a minute and go on to another, and I'll come back to it, you'll see the connection in a minute, if you just forgive me. 1968, April, 50th anniversary of the Royal Air Force. Some of you may remember this incident. Uh, a group of Hunter aircraft uh, were leaving Tangmere after a small detachment down at Tangmere, southern England, flying back to their home base in the UK. One gentleman, Flight Lieutenant Alan Pollock, I didn't know his name then, but I do now, <laughs> decided that he was going to celebrate the 50th celebration to the Air Force, as nobody else was, and he decided he would take his own aircraft to break away from the formation and fly up the River Thames and do a low fly pass of the Houses of Parliament. So he actually proceeded to do that. He got halfway along the Thames and suddenly he saw in front of him Tower Bridge, London Tower Bridge. He said in his subsequent, uh, subsequent inquiry, he said, uh, I had about 10 seconds to go when I saw this bridge. He said, like any true ground attack pilot, I couldn't resist it. <laughs> <laughs> and he flew, through, he flew through the arch, <laughs> as you can see by that slide. I think it was about that point in his fly past that he decided his career wasn't going to go much further. <laughs> and so actually, he uh, took the opportunity to do a low-level fly past of every airfield he could find between Tower Bridge and his own base. <laughs> He was subsequently uh, discharged from the Air Force medically. Um, he was a good pilot, actually. He was one of the Black Arrows display pilots. It's just a shame. Anyway, fast forward to the Moscow trip. That's where I met this guy. <laughs> so if you fast forward to the Moscow trip, I was sitting in my hotel room at Heathrow, and I got a phone call from a Mr. Pollock. Same man. I didn't know at the time. He said, uh, are you squadron leader Hall? And I said, yes. He said, uh, I've got a, a very ornate picture, a beautiful picture it was, I saw it, of a Hawker Hunter squadron and a box of cigars, which have some relevance to the war uh, and, and Russia, which I, I didn't understand at the time. And he said, I want to give these to Mrs. Thatcher so that she can give them to Mr. Gorbachev. So I said, well, nothing comes on this aeroplane without the sanction of Downing Street, so please talk to Downing Street and uh, get, get, get permission. That was the last I heard of him. The following morning, we arrived at the VIP lounge. All the VIP party arrive, and suddenly into the middle of the VIP lounge walks this chap with his um, picture, his box of cigars, escorted by the British Airport Authority duty manager. And he walked straight across to me, the duty manager, and he said, this is Mr. Pollock. He says he's spoken to you, which of course he had, technically. He's yeah. spoken to you, and he's got this for the Prime Minister. As he did that, the Prime Minister actually walked in the other door. So I, I couldn't do anything obvious. So what I did was took the picture and the box of cigars, take them across, get them x-rayed, to my load master who went across, got them x-rayed, don't put them on the aeroplane. And I said to Mr. Pollock, sit there. And I put him next to a double door where I could push him out if he started to play any games or be funny. When Mrs. Thatcher came in, I went to her right-hand man and said, sorry, Mr. Powell, Sir Charles Powell now. I'm sorry, I've got a bloke here. He said, what's his name? I said, Mr. Pollock. He went bright red, <laughs> rushed across the room, grabbed this brand by the lapels and shoved him through the door <laughs> into the Metropolitan Police Arms and they escorted him off. I couldn't do any more of course, I, it was all over by then so I made sure the picture was off, the cigars were off the aeroplane and we got airborne. Charles Powell asked me later on what had happened and I told him 
And he said, that flag has been bothering us for weeks, but no one had told the Air Force, of course. <laughs> when I got home again, you can gather what's going to happen. Another phone call, same group captain. It had made the telegraph, and he said, you allowed a VIP, uh, an intruder into the VIP lounge at Heathrow. I said, listen, sir, if you bothered bother to talk to me, I'll tell you what actually happened. And it was nothing to do with the Air Force. So there was another incident. Just a couple more, very quick, and I'll finish. Probably boring you to death. <coughs> Birthday cake. Um, Jeffrey Howe, Sir Jeffrey Howe. His PPS, his personal private secretary, were on a trip around the Middle East. It was his 40th birthday. I had a good liaison with the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Um, they told me it was his 40th birthday, good to do anything special. So that was our in flight rations from Heathrow. <laughs> All one like it. All right, it was a three foot square cake. Trouble is on the VC-10, there's nowhere to put a cake, not to hide it anyway. So it had to go in the front baggage hole. The rear <laughs> baggage hole is for the baggage, the front one is usually empty. Unfortunately, the VC-10 is a very old aeroplane. It needs its own tow bar. The tow bar is a bit antiquated, it's a huge device. It was strapped down in the forward hole as well. We, we, you can guess what's going to happen. <laughs> we flew to Mos, uh, Muscat. Muscat was a bit bumpy on the approach. Quite a heavy landing. Tow bar moves. Cracks the icing all across the cake. <laughs> Splits in half. I had to find the British Army chef at Muscat. Get it re-iced overnight. So the whole thing was re-iced. <laughs> the sequence of that is the following day on the on the leg from Muscat to Yemen. Uh, we actually bought the cake up then because that was his birthday and uh, I asked Sir Geoffrey how to keep him occupied while we got it ready. We put 40 candles on it, lit 40 candles. The heat coming off it was more than your average bushfire. And we, we actually, I walked in front of it holding the curtains apart on this aeroplane to keep them away from the fire and we sang the quickest happy happy birthday song you've ever heard and I said quickly blow them out <laughs> but uh, he, he was well appreciated final one then I'm on the Africa trip that I talked about earlier come back from the Africa trip with Mrs Thatcher and the um, what do they call it the diplomatic office I think the foreign commonwealth office or the diplomatic cell asked for my diplomatic clearance signals didn't tell me why, they just asked for them, said we want to see them. So I couriered them down to them. And the following day he said, thank you very much for your speedy response. He said the reason we wanted them was the intelligence services noted that a missile was fired at your aircraft. We just wanted to make sure you had the right diplomatic clearance. Knew <laughs> <laughs> nothing about it. <laughs> I hope that was some interest. Um, it was different from what you normally do, I know. Um, it's a different world, I appreciate that, but maybe it gives you some idea what I got involved in. So I hope you enjoy it. <laughs>